and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Christopher Steele. The guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. The story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. ABC News, America's number one news source. Good morning, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. This morning, concerns are growing for Ukraine's nuclear power plants. Ukrainian authorities say the Chernobyl power plant, now under Russian control, has been knocked off its power grid and is running on emergency generators. The Ukrainians say the outage could put cooling systems at risk. Renewed evacuation efforts are underway across Ukraine today in response to another ceasefire agreement aimed at allowing civilians to escape. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky issued a new message this morning, again urging the West to send Russian-made warplanes to Poland, uh, or rather from Poland to Ukraine. Polish leaders have agreed to send the jets to a U.S. NATO air base in Germany, but the Pentagon so far has rejected the proposal over the risk it could expand the war beyond Ukraine. Our senior foreign correspondent Ian Panel starts us off from Kiev. This morning, thousands of civilians attempting to flee their homes again amid renewed attempts at local ceasefire agreements. Previous ones have repeatedly failed. Well, that is what a Russian ceasefire sounds like. We're on the outskirts of the town of Irpin. We've been hearing the sound of bombardment over the last hour as civilians try to get out, as ambulances try and go in and rescue people, as they try and use the opportunity to get out of the town and to safety. But still, there are dangers. Still, there's bombardment. Among those seeking refuge are some of the most vulnerable, the elderly, who can't travel on their own. We spoke with 85-year-old Nina Mikhailova, who was forced to flee the bombing. She says, I can't believe it. Since my childhood, I thought the Russians and Ukrainians were fraternal people. How could this happen? A caregiver writing her information on her arm with a pen in case she gets lost during the evacuation. Amid the talk of ceasefires, the attacks go on. Malin struck overnight, destroying homes and the emergency services saying five people were killed, including three babies born last year. One area where a humanitarian corridor was established under a temporary ceasefire is Sumy, near the Russian border. 5,000 civilians successfully evacuated by bus on Tuesday. But their city has been devastated. In this video circulating online, the sound of tank fire can be heard in the distance as civilians prepare to leave. The Ukrainian military releasing this footage, they claim, shows a column of destroyed Russian tanks and other vehicles in the Sumy region. Ukrainian troops seen with captured ammunition. But conditions for many are now dire. The southern city of Mariupol has been under siege for days, cut off without power or heating, and now running low on supplies. An attempt to get people out from there failed 
after Ukraine said Russian mortars struck an evacuation route. For those trying to flee, the journey to safety has been long and difficult. And as Matt Gutman saw, it isn't over yet. This is the prop room at the Resurrection Theater. It is now filled with donations. Uh, on this side, you can see stuffed animals. There are books over there. A family here eating breakfast. And in here, I want you to see something. This is the main theater hall where 27 people sleep at night. Now, the mayor of Lviv says that every institution in this city is now filled with refugees. There are 200,000 of them in this city. He says they can't take any more. They need outside help. In another blow to the Russian economy, President Biden now banning imports of Russian oil into the United yeah, States. Americans have rallied, support, have rallied to support their Ukrainian people and made it clear we will not be part of subsidizing Putin's war. This comes as a senior U.S. defense official says that despite fierce resistance, the Russian invasion force is still 95 percent intact. And the CIA director warning Russia could soon escalate its attacks even further. Putin is angry and frustrated right now. He's likely to double down and try to grind down the Ukrainian military with no regard for civilian casualties. Ukraine's asked for fighter jets to help stop the onslaught, but confusion among NATO allies after Poland said it had turned over Soviet-era MiG-29 fighter jets to America to give to the Ukrainian military. U.S. officials caught off guard and the Pentagon dismissing the proposal as untenable, adding, it's simply not clear to us that there is a substantive rationale for it. Ukrainian President Zelensky appealing directly to Russian soldiers this morning to leave, saying, we won't surrender. Zelensky rallying not just his own nation, but others too. Addressing the British Parliament, borrowing from the rousing words of its wartime leader, Winston Churchill. Saying, we will fight in the forests, the fields, the shores and in the streets. It was an unprecedented moment receiving a rousing standing ovation. Well, although we have seen small lulls in... Is it on? Is it on? Yeah, I think it's on. Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to this. This is the third instalment of the In Search Research Design and Journalism Cell. I'm Gabrielle Kennedy. I run the cell. I'm a journalist and also editor-in-chief of Dam Magazine. Today, our topic is crime, and we will explore with academics, journalists, designers and artists, the overlap, the conflict, and the potential of design and journalism in covering understanding and communicating events with a social core. Recently, we see a lot of talk in art and design schools about journalism, design as journalism, artists using journalism as a research tool. It's potentially fascinating, but sometimes seeded with problems because journalism is strictly and traditionally speaking, focused on covering the news as impartially as possible. Without fear or favor is how the New York Times puts it. A journalist aims to treat their audience and sources as fairly and as openly as possible. With that said, there was a strand of journalism popular in the 60s and 70s that certainly showed a sharper overlap between art and journalism. It was called new journalism, and it is probably better explained as a literary movement. It combined the techniques of fiction writing with the fact-based approach of reporting. The results aspired to a type of literary excellence. The narrative usually unfolded in scenes. There was a lot of dialogue, there is a strong point of view within the story, and there is an abundance of illustrative, revealing details that ordinarily would not be included in traditional reporting. Norman Mailer, a big star of new journalism, called it enormously personalized journalism in which the character of the narrator was one of the elements in the way the reader would finally assess the experience. 
My personal favourite, the inimitable and brilliant Joan Didion, told the Paris Review in 2006 about her motivation to write this way. It was remarkably simple. Something about a situation will bother me, she said, so I will write a piece to find out what it is that bothers me. Critics of the style argue that immersion in the subject matter made it impossible for the writer to report objectively on events because new journalism was never objective. It was proudly subjective. So on the one hand, you had detractors who said to blend fact with the author's interpretation of events made it difficult for the reader to know what to believe. And on the other hand, you had the movement's proponents who claimed it was just this combination of a strong point of view with scrupulously researched facts that gave this form of journalism its power. Now to me, as a journalist, the difference between journalism and new journalism has only really ever been about good writing. To me, journalists who could write really well were far more interested in new journalism than those that stuck to the more formulaic style which is arguably why new journalism fell out of fashion. Print journalists write. Even journalists using other mediums write scripts, and they write to a formula. But that's not necessarily good writing, and new journalism demands can only exist with good writing. The other reason new journalism slipped away was financial. It costs more, a lot more. But despite its brief reign, what new journalism proved was that it was not only hard-nosed journalists who could communicate the news. Its main practitioners showed that many of the best innovations and ideas didn't come from the newsroom, but from a more personal pursuit of knowledge. And so it's here that I see a collision between journalism, art and design, a creative overlap where divergent voices with differing techniques and methods are allowed to explore facts and stories. Because let's be honest, Artists, designers, and journalists have a lot in common. Journalists call it reporting. Artists call it research. New journalists and artists are skeptical of convention. New journalists and artists are adept at finding the voice or the situation that is telling about a broader picture. New journalists and artists are astute observers, fearless and original. New journalists and artists have refined instincts. And importantly, both art and journalism are very much about reputation. So to break the ethics, the codes of conduct in either is to self-destruct. Equally, I think all these disciplines share some methodologies. If one thinks of journalism as an article, a clip, a film, a segment, or even an image as an object, it starts as a lump of material, unsorted, unrefined. It needs crafting, refining. It must be erased redone, rethought, perfected. It needs some color, some additional something that feels missing, more experiments, more failures, and then of course that last minute idea that brings it all so beautifully together. To me, the big difference between art and journalism is where the practitioner looks. Do they travel in towards themselves or out towards others? This is just a very personal take, but I know in my work I reach out towards others. I cultivate my sources. That is an essential skill of what I do. I'm trying to convince others to tell me the truth, while artists, arguably, are trying to convince themselves to tell the truth. I've spent the night with a world-renowned world -renowned and celebrated photographer who at 4 a.m. and after too many bottles of vodka decided I was trustworthy enough to reveal his personal stash of pedophile images. Now let me be frank, I never lied. I never tried to deceive him. I had no clue that the stash even existed. I had an instinct and I stuck out the night. What I was was open, open to him, not judgmental, to the point where he felt comfortable enough to tell me his truth. And that is something that you really can't fake. I've had tea with a convicted cannibal who told me, who told me he had no memory of killing, dismembering or eating his Dutch victim, except if he did remember, he's quite sure that she would have tasted delicious. I hunted down leads until I found a retired masseuse who became my main source in unraveling the hugely corrupt world of sumo wrestling. What started off as a food story for a food magazine about appetite, calories and health ended up being about rigged games, political interference and lost millions. That story had the Japanese mafia sitting outside my apartment for two weeks. The, the key to all these pieces is that I didn't ever go hunting for a particular story. I genuinely never know where my story is going to end. Reporting creates facts, 
and facts drive the narrative. But in art and design, that is rarely the case. So if artists and designers want to borrow, beg or steal from journalism using its terms, arguable credibility and position, then they need to importantly acknowledge and then grapple and deal with these differences. But let's for the moment at least revel in the very real overlap. And I think crime reporting is the ideal beat to explore this. Crime is a snapshot of our cultural values. Crime and how we deal with it is designed. Crime reflects what we as a society support and abhor. Recently, a situation has been brewing in New York over the convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein and his sidekick, Hislane Maxwell, who was recently convicted of human sex trafficking. It's a global criminal conspiracy involving a prince, an elite Parisian modeling agency, a tech magnet, a socialite, and a university dropout billionaire who may or may not have been murdered, as well as the so far unknown contents of all their little black books. We could spend weeks talking about the particularities of Maxwell's trial, which even yesterday took a new turn when one of the jurors admitted to lying on his jury selection form, which, which has the potential to overthrow the entire verdict. But instead, I want to mention briefly how Hislaine Maxwell's trial was covered. What set it apart was the mostly women reporters who lined up at 4 a.m. in the freezing cold every morning to get a seat in court to cover this. Some were trained reporters, but many weren't. What they all were, were dogged, sharp, intuitive, and original, like journalists. But, like artists, they were rarely devoid of emotion. They were vulnerable, they were not detached, and nor did they always agree with one another. Their stories, often not even shared on traditional media outlets, were unpolished, raw, real, and wholly relatable. Details that would not usually fit into the formula were added, debated, and revisited. Some implanted themselves in the story and all played with the rules that usually guide and of course limit the news format. These were subjective conversations between author and audience, conversations that gained momentum and tied back into the next day's coverage. This coverage had the emotional power of art. And indeed, the sick universe of Hussein Maxwell boasts even more sinister links back to art, design and culture, and even specifically to art education. Maxwell's former lover and associate, and who knows or even cares what details, was Jeffrey Epstein. He is now dead, an apparent suicide he committed while in jail before his own trial even commenced. Epstein cultivated an expansive network of powerful and influential contacts in a wide array of fields, including art institutions, collectors, and cultural enterprises. Jeffrey Epstein donated almost one million US dollars to the MIT Media Lab, a research centre for technology, media, science, art and design in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Joichi Ito, the director, has since apologised and resigned for not just taking the money, but also visiting Epstein in his many luxurious properties, where together with his circle of friends, committed the most heinous crimes against young girls. The issue here, and this is really important, is that Epstein managed to cultivate a credible existence his presence in the art world bolstered his reputation, which in turn served to distract us from his horrifying acts. One of the first women to speak against Epstein was Maria Farmer, who graduated from the New York Academy of Art in 1995. At her thesis graduation show, a German buyer offered her $12,000 for one of her paintings. But soon after, Eileen Guggenheim, the school's dean of students at the time and who still today sits on the board, pressured Farmer to instead sell her work to a lesser price to Jeffrey Epstein. Farmer has said that Guggenheim told her, you'll be selling to them. They are great benefactors of the academy and you are going to make them happy. Do you understand? Epstein apparently told the aspiring artist not to worry because he would make the connection with him worth her while. Soon after her graduation, Farmer says Guggenheim brought her to Epstein's New Mexico ranch and told her to act grateful and tell him how wonderful he is. And so started a manipulative dance of grooming and abuse that also involved Maria's younger 16-year-old sister. Back in New York, Epstein offered Maria a job as an art advisor and assistant at his New York townhouse where she met Donald Trump. It was the Farmer sisters whose early interview back in 2003 with journalist Vicky Ward of Vanity Fair never made it to print. Instead, the magazine's publisher, Graydon Carter, opted for a more mysterious and celebratory piece under the headline, The Talented Mr. Epstein. Art crosses into crime and then back into journalism. 
Why did Vanity Fair not break this story? It's a big question that reveals the compliance and connection that exists between art, design and journalism, and one that I think will come better to understand today with our lineup of great speakers. Talking to us about all this and more are two of the women reporters who covered this story, Lucia Osborne Crowley, author of My Body Keeps Your Secrets. Lucia also broke the controversial story about Juror 50 in the Maxwell case, who in an interview with her after the guilty verdict was handed down, admitted to having been abused himself, a detail he never disclosed, despite being specifically asked in jury selection. We'll also hear from academic researcher Stein Postema, who will talk more specifically about journalism and art, as well as students and alumni from Reitfeld Academy and Sandberg Institute, whose own artistic research deals with the issues we've been discussing on crime and journalism. Elki Boada, Maria Mazanti, Yuri Suzuki and Justine Wesselow. And we'll end with Brie Logan, a digital culture specialist who also covered the formula um, with, with no room for creativity and certainly no room for personal perspective. Um, so this was always taboo um, and, you know, anyone who's trained traditionally as a journalist will tell you this. Um, and I just, you know, over my career, I've, I've come to believe that that doesn't serve us for certain types of stories um, because there are certain types of stories that require someone to um, be able to tell you their own story and be able to explain and create a connection with the reader that is stronger than the kind of dispassionate, uh, quote unquote, objective news format. Um, and also I think, you know, the history of news is that, and, and the history of all things, the history of law as well, um, talking about crime, uh, the things we think are objective um, uh, are in fact just um, the, the, the objective, objectivity is created by the powerful people in society and is created by structures. So this idea of people being objective um, is really false. And people, you know, no one is incapable of not bringing their own personal experiences to bear um, when they interpret something external in the world. Um, so, you know, I went to law school, I'm also a lawyer. Um, and when, when I was in law school, I remember so clearly uh, this one lesson we had where a professor was saying that there's this movement now um, in, in the law, which is for judges to stop pretending to be completely objective and unbiased and rather to own up to their biases and, and explain how those biases are informing their decision making. And what's behind that movement, and it's the same thing that is behind new journalism, is the understanding that, um, and this is what this professor said to me this day many years ago in law school, um, it, it, it's this idea that if you pretend to not have any biases, what you're doing is, is burying those biases and presenting something um, as factual when in fact, as you know, everything is our own interpretation of the world. Um, and I'll come to this, but you know, having conversations with um, often male reporters um, at the Ghislaine Maxwell trial who believed themselves to be objective, but were saying things um, that were kind of deeply informed by societal attitudes towards women and societal attitudes towards victims of sexual violence. You know, it just um, really demonstrated this point. So as I said, um, you know, I just wanna tell you a little bit about how I got here. Um, I started my career as a journalist um, covering gender-based violence because it's always been a passion of mine. Um, so I've always uh, been reporting on things linked to crime. Um, I started my career in Australia and I was covering sexual violence and domestic violence. So I was in court a lot. I was covering rape, rape trials and, and also reading every day about statistics, about gender-based violence and sexual violence and sexual abuse. And every day I was writing news stories about it. And the interest in these topics was negligible. And it really is depressing because, you know, this is something that was so important to me and I didn't really understand why at the time um, but it was really important to me and, and no one was really connecting with these stories um, until uh, I had a kind of personal crisis in, in my life uh, that forced me to come forward for the first time to my doctors and my therapists about uh, my own experience of childhood sexual abuse um, in a situation 
with dynamics that are not too dissimilar to um, what happened with Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell um, in the sense that I was uh, abused in as a child by adults that I trust with and, and that I loved um, and who groomed me. And then I was sexually assaulted as a teenager in this very violent situation and I never reported that to the police and I never told anyone about it because I felt so ashamed and I and I felt that I had that I had done something wrong. Um, and I internalized all these attitudes that we have about survivors of sexual violence, all these attitudes that are incorrect. Um, but I believed them to be true and I never did anything about it. And once I disclosed this information um, to my doctors, uh, this whole world opened up for me where I could get help and and get treatment for you know the trauma that that these experiences had left me with. And as a journalist, I, I just decided, you know, because this situation was so overwhelming for me, I was in appointments every day. I was on kind of long-term sick leave from work. Um, I was working in law at the time and working in kind of long-form journalism on the side. And so in order to kind of separate myself from the story, I, I pretended that I was reporting a story about someone else. So I took my notebook into all of my medical appointments um, and I wrote down these notes as if I was writing another news story. And I came out of it um, with all this information that I, as a gender reporter, didn't even know until, you know, I was in this situation myself. And I decided to write it down, not ever, ever intending to publish it because I had been taught from the first day of my career to never make the story about myself and to never put myself in the story. So I, I wrote it down just, just to help me understand it. Um, and then I thought to myself, you know, this might, this information might be useful to people. And um, also, you know, there are so many barriers to healthcare, so many barriers to the kind of care that I was getting. Um, and when you write about something, you can kind of break down those barriers a little bit. So I published this piece and half a million people viewed it in, in the first few hours that it was published. And it was a long form piece about my experience of abuse and 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 how what I'd learned diving into my own experience of abuse, what I learned about the systems that uphold abuse, um, the systems that prote protect perpetrators like Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, and you know it was this really um, kind of personal experience of why what we call new journalism connects with people in a way that traditional journalism doesn't, and and that piece turned into my first book, which turned into my second book, um, both of which are, are, are works of, of new journalism. Um, and, you know, that experience just just showed me that, you know, there are some stories, I think, um, that need to be told in a way that, that crosses over into art in order to give people permission to understand them a bit better. You know, there are things that we, that are very difficult to confront and it's hard to confront them in a traditional news format and so people don't confront them people don't click on those stories they don't get to the end you know um and we we saw this with the maxwell trial people weren't really engaging with the kind of standard news coverage um so in my books i kind of and again you know the last thing i ever would have imagined was to to write a, a book of journalism that had my own story in it um but it, it was a way that I was able to connect with other survivors. And also, you know, I've had so much feedback from people who say, um, you know, this book is, is how I learned to learned about grooming or, or really was able to understand how abuse works. People who aren't survivors themselves um, and kind of only have a real window into it when they have access to the story through a personal lens. And as Gabrielle said, you know, that is where art and journalism cross over, I think, um, because the journalist is traditionally supposed to be fact-finding external to themselves, and the artist is is looking inward to find the truth. Um, and there is a there is a way that those two things can combine, and I and I think it's a really beautiful thing. And you know, I've now dedicated um, many years to this practice, and and so as you can tell, I'm sure I, I really believe in it, and I think it's really powerful. Um, and so I think it's great that we're having conversations like this. And um, I actually think, you know, in so I'm writing a book about um, the Maxwell trial, which which will include these reflections about um, how other 
reporters kind of saw themselves as being very objective, but were in fact entrenching and, and repeating things that myself as someone who has researched trauma for a long time, know are kind of ingrained societal attitudes that are actually incorrect about trauma, things like um, what we call rape myths, which are um, incorrect but widely held beliefs about sexual violence, one of which is um, that delayed disclosure is suspicious, um, one of which is that uh, inconsistent details are suspicious when uh, if you're trauma informed, you know that in fact inconsistent details are a core part of um, traumatic memory. Um, so uh, in writing this book um, about the Maxwell trial, I've, I've been thinking a lot about new journalism and I actually think we are almost at what I like to call new new journalism. You know, um, there was a there was a period this you know real renaissance with with people like Joan Didion and Janet Malcolm who wrote a book called The Journalist and the Murderer, which is uh, one of my favourite uh, works of all time. People like Truman Capote who kind of uh, invented what he called the nonfiction novel with in cold blood. Um, but even you know, even then there was there was still you know it was so groundbreaking to have a personal um, angle in the story, and I and I think we've gone even further than that now, and we are even more committed to the crossover between literature and art and journalism. And the example I always use for this is um, when the serial podcast came out, and of course you know that is crime reporting as well, and you know that that podcast not only kind of invented the podcasting as a genre as we currently know it, um, but also I think it was a really important moment in new, new journalism. Um, and that's because A, it wasn't afraid to take its time. It was a long form, um, a really long form piece of reporting. Um, but also because Sarah Koenig was really, really willing to be upfront about her personal interest in the story about the conflicts that she was feeling with, with her sources, um, about the kind of moral quandaries that a journalist is in when they're trying to tell a high stakes story. Um, and we now know that there are so many examples of this where stories about crime, um, when journalists come to them and they are willing to kind of put themselves on the line, um, that's what creates change in the legal system, you know, um, serial, uh, led to a retrial, um, and that's because there are. Um, I was talking to another journalist. Um, I met a I met a literary festival at the moment, and so many of the sessions have been about literary journalism because it's, there's a huge movement um, happening in Australia right now that's really embracing this as an art form. And I was speaking to someone on a panel yesterday um, about this idea of you know having skin in the game and and really being able to be up front with your reader. About, about this and uh, you know about your stake in the story as the journalist. Um, and that's what connects with people and you know and that's what connects with people with serial. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the first story that, that kind of took off in this new era of new journalism was a story about gender-based violence. You know, this was a story of a person who was accused of killing his ex-girlfriend. Um, so this is a story about domestic abuse. Um, and again, I don't think it's a coincidence that that was the type of story that captured our imaginations in this form because we were able to understand those dynamics because Sarah was able to be so upfront with her listener um, with in terms of how she was feeling um, and, and in terms of her personal involvement with the story. And of course, this comes with lots of issues. You know, it's really complicated um, and you have to be willing for it to be complicated in order, I think, to reap the benefits of it. Um, but I just, you know, I, I'm grateful for events like this because I do think it's a really important thing for us to be talking about both as artists and uh, as journalists and as designers because, um, you know, enabled, when, when we look at all these disciplines squarely, I think that's when we can really embrace um, the overlaps between them and also work out the kind of ethical problems that that come with that. Um, and so I think, you know, as I said, co covering the Ghislaine Maxwell trial was a really interesting experience for me because uh, 
again, to use this very Australian expression, I do absolutely have skin in the game and I can't deny that because I was sitting in a trial where, where there were expert witnesses talking about the process of grooming and there were uh, women who were talking about the way they felt about, you know, a godfather figure who um, was abusing them and all, all of that is something I know personally. Um, I know what that feels like. Um, and I was often in that trial, not in the actual courtroom, um, because there were very few of us in there, but there were a lot of male reporters in the overflow rooms and covering this story. Um, and I found it very hard sometimes to have conversations with them because um, some of the things that, that they took away uh, from the trial were, you know, so different from my experience of the world um, as, as a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. Um, and uh, I, I just think that that kind of really points to why, I th you know, I think it's really important to have both of these things. I think it's important to embrace traditional journalism, and I also think it's important to embrace journalism as art while being really uh, willing to confront uh, the, some, the, the complications that, that come with that. Um, so I will stop rambling and I will let you all go. Um, but thank you for your time, um, and I really hope um, you enjoy the rest of the sessions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lucia. Um, so next up we'll have Stein. I work at the University of Amsterdam and at Ode Stichting University of Applied Sciences. Um, uh, I'm also working on a, a dissertation. Yeah. This way. This good? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I also work on a dissertation and it's a paper based uh, presentation. Uh, this is the last slide, so let's go to the first. Yep. Thank you. Yep, lovely. So what I will do in this session, I hope to do. I thought it was there. Yeah, it's not there. Okay, so what I want to do in this session is first make a kind of a plea for uh, ac accountability in art and in artwork. And the second thing is that I will, uh, at the end, as a kind of a uh, kind of an extra, provide you with a list of organizations that I've been uh, in touch with that support uh, those who want to work in uh, arts and journalism and combine the two. Um, so, um, okay, first I would like to know who I'm talking to actually. <laughs> so you are here studying at the Rietveld Academy, is that correct? Not anymore in the past, so you work as an artist now? Okay, so. Um, and you're, you came here because you're somehow interested in how you combine this, how you can combine this with journalism. Is that correct? Yeah. And do you know anything about journalism yet, or is that totally new to you? Or you know, apart from reading the paper or reading your news, your daily news. Okay. So, um, I have a background uh, in journalism, and I have a kind of a dread kind of a, a secret that I had during working as a journalist. I worked uh, as a freelancer for 15 years. I also made art. And I never revealed that I was working as an artist uh, during the time that I uh, was working as a journalist to my editors. And that has a reason. And we uh, know, ha well, you heard about the stories from Lucia and from, uh, um, from Gabriella already. But have you any idea why it wasn't possible to, to, to reveal to my editors that I also work as an artist because there is a kind of a bias within journalism that if you are a creative person that you are not going to make your deadlines it's very easy it's like that so uh, I, I never told them and um, that that's made me feel uh, uncomfortable and at a certain point I thought okay but there must be something that I can do to combine the two so I started making infographics and, and things like that and I 
found out, okay, there are, there are possibilities. So one of the possibilities uh, Gabriele and Lucia d just described were in writing. The new journalism movement is a writing movement. And I suppose as artists, you are not just writers, right? You make exhibitions and do things like that. So I started to explore more and I found out that there are, is much more going on uh, between journalism and arts. And historically also that, that um, the first newspaper is written in rhyme, it's poetics. And so there's so much more um, uh, that that uh, brings the two uh, together. So I am now working on a dissertation. My first paper is uh, has been published. It's called Artistic Journalism on the Confluences Between um, Arts and uh, Journalism in Practice, in Values, and um, in um, um, sorry. Uh, and in forms, and this is a kind of a theoretical model, model that allows me to study both beyond the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the supposed uh, differences. So uh, this theoretical mod model allowed me to then um, go on uh, and publish about uh, theater and, and um, journalism, a paper called Theater Reportage. I hope that it's somewhere in the next month or so that will be out in a journalism studies uh, journal. Um, and this results, uh, resulted in some new uh, theoretical insight. Uh, for example, that you can employ the human body uh, actually as a journalistic medium. And for uh, journalists, that is very new to experience, to have the idea that you can use your own body to, uh, as a journalist to, for example, um, um, if you go on a reportage, uh, you gather facts and you talk to people. If you're an actor, you're looking at how people behave and you copy their behavior in your, uh, in your body. So that is a way that you can also be a journalist. And it takes a bit too long to talk about it now, but uh, you can read the paper. And uh, at the moment I'm working on uh, another paper on uh, intermediaries of journalism and art. And this is interesting for you as well because uh, they support and they give grants and, and they can help you as an artist to develop this. Um, so I will give you the list of these uh, at the end. Um, is it okay with the, because it sounds a bit uh, off, right? So, um, so I kept these uh, uh, worlds uh, separated. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the picture visualizing that in a way. Uh, so some years ago, I was uh, at, a, at a conference in Perugia, a, a famous journalism conference, and I met this cinematographer, uh, Matteo Bastianelli, and we were talking about his documentaries and the use of black and white and the use of soundtracks and the use of lightning and stuff. And at a certain point, he said to me, I want them to feel what I feel. And I was there with my journalism students, and I w when I told them what uh, Matteo said to me, they were like, okay, that's not journalism, because journalism is about facts. That's what Lucy, uh, Lucia just said, and that's what Gabriella just said. It's about facts. Well, at the same time, we feel a lot of things, and we want to be socially engaged. We want to be compassionate about the things we uh, report on. But in journalism, traditionally, facts are sacred, and uh, in fact, if you uh, look at the academic literature, it's an ideology, and it's positioned at, as an ideology by the practitioners of it. So to, to understand what journalism is, uh, you're not just talking about making the news and um, having a profession. They, they don't have a law uh, saying what you should or should not do as a journalist. They have this ideology that uh, most of them agree on. And uh, so these are five points that um, uh, Mark Deuze uh, at the University of Amsterdam uh, actually described in uh, a paper, What is Journalism? So it's about public service, uh, uh, your, your uh, loyalty is to the citizen, Th these are your clients, the citizen, not a, some corporation, not some, someone in power, citizen. Um, you have this objectivity norm, uh, which is very important, you are supposed to be impartial and neutral, which of course clashes at the moment that you feel compassionate about, uh, like the story uh, on, uh, on Epstein, of course, and, and the victims that he made, you feel what is there. So uh, being objective in such cases is very 
some, somehow clashing with uh, the professionals. And um, you have autonomy, which is uh, uh, something that is very important in, in journalism. Uh, the same word is used in arts, of course. Uh, and it describes in journalism that you are um, free and independent. So you're not uh, working for uh, some company of, or some political party. And uh, then you have the ethics. Journalists need to have a sense of ethics, uh, which is important for their reputation. Um, so on a more, on a more practical level, uh, this is a book written by uh, Kovac and Rosenstiel. It's called The Elements of Journalism. And they have all these points. Um, they uh, interviewed a lot of chief editors around the world and they came to these, um, these rules that most of these chief editors uh, need. So uh, you have an obligation to uh, tell the truth and verify facts. Uh, you have the obligation to be loyal to the citizen. Um, the verification of information is key to, to your work. Um, the, uh, uh, as a journalist, you need to be independent. Um, one of your main tasks is to hold those in power accountable for what they are doing. Now, here are some other uh, rules they, they mention in the same book, so to say. Um, and one I think is very important is to maintain a personal sense of ethics and responsibility. And the last one, citizens have rights and responsibilities as well. So you help them as a journalist to become media literate. So this is, this is what chief editors around the world think is journal journalism is about. And that is quite interesting because this is translated into the editorial guidelines that most of the news media around the world uh, have written for, for themselves. And they present this to their journalists and say, okay, if you work for us, these are the guidelines that you need to employed during your work. Um, these are their values and standards um, and codes of ethics. So I recommend if you if you're interested in this, uh, you can go to the accountability um, are there, yeah no accountabilityjournalism.org and you find there a huge data database with all kinds of uh, ethical codes. Now why do I show this? Because I strongly believe uh, that you as an artist, if you start calling your work journalism, and move beyond applying journalistic processes, uh, such as interviewing people or verifying uh, facts in a different way, in a journalistic way, um, that you might seriously consider to write a code of ethics for yourself so that you can be held accountable for what you do. And I'm pleading for this because in the real world at the moment, uh, the real world is perfectly capable of uh, blurring the lines between what's real and what's fiction, um, between facts and fiction. And um, I believe that we need artists who are um, in their truth practice, uh, understand these mechanisms because they know how they work, because they have this, this artistic background in, in how to manipulate and how to, to change and alter reality. Uh, and at the same time, if you're socially engaged as an artist, I believe that it's important to to choose to be accountable for what you do. In the, in the arts, for art's sake, um, ideology, so to say, you have no reason to be held accountable for what you do because it's, it's the artwork that decides what has to be done. And at the moment that you decide, okay, I want to, to do something that has impact on society, um, it also means that you have to take responsibility for that task. So that's why I plea for, uh, for accountability. Um, so I, I assume that, that that's the reason why you are interested in, in journalism, to be uh, socially engaged in art. So indeed, uh, architects, uh, artists, theatre makers, musicians, they all can perform the art of journalism just as well and maybe better than real journalists. So for example, uh, what you see here is uh, forensic architecture. Uh, I, I think you know forensic architecture, right? And they're a London-based uh, multidisciplinary collective with art exhibitions all around the world. And in their projects, um, in, in this project, uh, airstrikes on the Al-Jina Mosque, 
Um, the team analyzed a U.S. airstrike in Syria in 2017. Now, the U.S. Central Command uh, claimed at the time U.S. forces conducted an airstrike on Al-Qaeda in Syria on March 16th, and they killed several terrorists. Now, forensic architecture conducted interviews, examined images, and re reconstructed a model of the building. Because of their architectural knowledge, they were able to read the building differently and reconstruct what really happened. And that was 38 civilians, including five children, uh, were killed. So they, through their work as architects, they did something that reminds of these uh, journalistic values that you just saw. They were holding those in power accountable. Another one is uh, Human Flow, um, a documentary, also well known, I suppose, uh, in which, uh, w which is a typical example of, of uh, being loyal to the citizen and give a voice to minorities. And I see that a lot happen in, uh, in artistic work that really touches uh, journalism, that, that there is a, a way of uh, trying to tell the stories that are not often heard in the news today. Uh, you see here the work of uh, Alison Killing. Uh, she's an architect and she helps BuzzFeed to uh, analyze satellite images. And they produced uh, a piece on BuzzFeed and she got actually a Pulitzer Prize for this, which, which in journalism is the highest possible prize that you can achieve. It's American, however, <laughs> it's still the highest possible prize. Um, so, Here are some more uh, genres that I encountered during my research. And you basically see here all kinds of uh, art genres uh, represented, even dance, poetry, graphics, music. And um, so I have a lot of research to do still to, to address them all, of course. Um, so uh, what I find in my research is that uh, socially engaged artists um, give us reason uh, for uh, exploring journalism is that they want to create more impact in their work. Um, and that is far more important for a socially engaged artist, I think, than an art for art's sakes artist. Because uh, you, want, you want that your work does something in society, that it changes something somehow. So uh, the interesting thing is that this, uh, journalists are looking for the same impact towards arts and towards artists. So they feel that if they connect, if they work together, uh, the, the impact of their work can be, uh, can be higher, can be increased. Um, and an example is uh, one of the, one, one of the uh, intermediaries, uh, intermediaries between journalism and arts I spoke with is from uh, El Suti in uh, Paraguay. And uh, they have a news medium, and they also have a kind of a collective. It's called Latino Graficas. And in this collective, uh, journalists and illustrators work together, and they create memes together. And uh, the journalists do the research, and they have to make their stories much shorter to uh, allow them to become Insta Reels. And um, what happens is that their audience really increases because they work together. So, so indeed the impact is uh, much bigger and um, okay I'll give you I'll, I'll mention them now already okay uh, you have uh, no let's not do that let's go to this is this is kind of what I want to say here it says uh, takeaways but actually <laughs> it says key takeaways <laughs> so <laughs> it's a nuance on what I, <laughs> I want to tell you uh, so it's about um, all intermediary, intermediaries of these organizations I spoke to say that the confluence of the two wor uh, worlds is uh, creating impact, it's impactful. And um, I think in this confluence, confluence, the best of both worlds can be found in a deeper understanding of news events through the engaged and in-depth approach of the artist in combination with the ethically grounded approach found in a journalistic ideology. So the second point, for journalism, working together with artists uh, takes it back to their roots, actually. However, it is still new for journalism to work in this way. 
And that means that if you as an artist are going to collaborate with journalists, you have to convince them that you are in fact doing your research. There is, a, there is this bias that you have to overcome and that you need to, uh, well, uh, you, you, you need to work on convincing them, unfortunately. Um, and transparency is key, I think. And if you follow the work of forensic architecture, you can see that they make really transparent their uh, research process, right? They even make this beautiful narrated videos about it. Uh, and that tells their story of the research. So these are, these are tricks uh, to, to convince that what you're telling is well researched and, and, and uh, is factual. So the third thing is that um, I think that socially engaged art comes with the, uh, a responsibility, and especially if you are going to apply journalism. Instead of defending your work um, for art's sake, the approach requires you to look um, to your work process through the lens of ethical values you developed yourself before setting out on this compassionate, inspired journey. Um, so that is what I want to share with you. Um, here are some references. Uh, I can share them later through email or whatever. Um, so here you have a list of institutes that support artist journalists with grants, with uh, support, uh, uh, network support, if you want to reach out to, uh, to news organizations and know how to talk to them, uh, with editorial support. Um, they all have their own kind of uh, angle. Uh, iBeam is in New York, Ars Electronica is in Austria, uh, Arts Everywhere is in Canada, Outriders in Poland, uh, Latino Graficas uh, in uh, Paraguay, Aced in the Netherlands, actually. Um, and then you have the Center of Investi Investigative Journalism uh, Logan Symposium in uh, the UK. So uh, check them out. Maybe there's something for you there that uh, can uh, help you or uh, get, get a grant for something, which is also great. Uh, and then there's, of course, some reading to do. <laughs> and I can share you links to all these uh, articles if you want or share them in a PDF. Just send me an email. Or maybe, uh, Gabriella, you can help uh, uh, those who are interested to get this information. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, my apologies for the sound. It, uh, <laughs> it was in my head all the time. <laughs> so that uh, disturbed it a bit. Hello everyone, my name is Elke Boerdam and I'm currently graduating from Sandberg Institute. Uh, I'm a participant of the temporary master program F for Fact, uh, which is run by Barbara Fisser. And it's a department that studies knowledge and all different types of knowledge and what counts as knowledge uh, in 2023. Uh, I have a background in graphic design and image research. Uh, and before coming to Sandberg, I worked for two and a half years as a photo editor of Dutch daily newspaper, the Volkskrant. Uh, and working there taught me a lot about systems within journalism and especially about the role of images in reporting and storytelling. As photography is a big part of journalism and communication today. I got to see firsthand how photographs and other images acted as parallel facts. Like this. <laughs> um, so the images acting like parallel facts, facts next to the article, giving proof or evidence proof of events mentioned in the facts, but also how images served more as fictions, corroborating the stories told, adding emotion and intensity to the text. But I've always been interested in images, uh, images as facts, evidence, documents, records, but also as fabrications, illusions, and independent agents. Images communicate on so much more different levels than language, which makes them multifaceted and very complicated and interesting. Images call to a viewer's interpretation, emotion, reference, and memory, which are all different for every individual. So can an image tell one story only? 
This is a question that raises a lot of problems in journalism and even in criminal law. But it can also offer a lot of opportunities for artists and designers. And as we see, unfortunately, for dictators who use the multifariousness of an image for manipulation and truth twisting in favor of propaganda. Therefore, also, I think the work of a photo editor is quite important. But we also have to keep asking who is making this selection and with which intentions. In my time at Volkskrant, we were using image banks where you can purchase images for your news outlets. Uh, and one of them is Getty Images. But Getty is for some years now also developing a Getty bot. It's a service which you can uh, purchase from Getty and the uh, Getty AI will automatically select images for your story. This is of course an algorithm that has been taught by various photo editors using Getty Images as a service in the past decades. Um, <coughs> uh, so that also creates the question, what will happen to news coverage and other reporting if a machine determines what we should see and not someone with a specific eye and care for the content and the world this content comes from? I think this will be very problematic in the future. How, how we are supposed to see things happening around the world if a machine is in charge. Uh, and these are one of the worries, this is one of the worries that instigated my current research I'm now doing at Sandberg. This research or the project steps away a bit from my role as a photo edit editor in journalism, but it is dealing with who decides what we see and why. And how we should always keep questioning this and maybe even resisting this. So the past year I have been researching how randomness can serve can serve to fight predictive control and how images play a role in truth production systems of today. In my master's thesis I have just finished, I have written a science fiction story about a future where a world similar to ours is even more controlled by predictive systems just like algorithms, artificial intelligence and other new technologies. There are multiple reality channels set up in this world. The idea of one truth has been dismissed and every person is subscribed to one of these reality channels by birth. These channels are then dictating what to see and are fooling the members of society in believing that those are the things they actually want to see. But the protagonist of the story is called Smitty and she is suffering from this predictive control and is leading a very boring and totally predictable life without any responsibility. Therefore, she joins the Alliance the alliance to restore the randomness. An underground resistance movement who believes the only way to break free <coughs> out of this dictatorship of information and prediction is to restore randomness. This story is of course referring to our lives today where surveillance capitalism is harvesting our data to predict the future. But when everything is predictable, we also lose our sense of ethics. If the future already exists, why bother making decisions on what is wrong and right? Why take responsibility if the outcome is already set in stone? So I have been studying randomness as a counter to the increase of predictive control. Randomness not only as a method, but also as a way of thinking. Celebrating the unexpected instead of fearing it. The Alliance has a lot of different ways to insert images in unexpected places. Therefore creating moments of randomness, chance, serendipity and coincidence. And after this thesis, I'm now starting up this parafictional protest movement in the real. Searching for ways how the Alliance can restore, insert and use randomness in everyday life. This will result in image interventions in physical and digital space. Actions where the Alliance will confront audiences with the unexpected, trying to break systems of predictable content. And to maybe bring it back to journalism, we can al also wonder what would happen if the image next to an article is not carefully selected to support the story, but picked at random. What story would that image then tell? Could we use randomness as a tool to break conventional patterns in photojournalism and in biased storytelling? Would randomness endanger truth or maybe activate it? Get us to think about what we expect and why? Making us active readers again instead of passive news consumers. And 10 minutes is very short to talk about the Alliance, but we do have a website which you can access through the QR code. 
uh, and you can always join. Hi, my name is Judy. I was born in Fukushima, Japan, and I moved to Netherlands in 2008. I shortly returned to Tokyo for a year in 2010, at which time I witnessed both the Great East Japan earthquake and the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Afterwards, I started working for an independent web journal, which was launched by a journalist, Yasumi Iwakami, in Tokyo. As a native of Fukushima at the time, what was broadcasted in Fukushima through TV and the internet looked like fiction. The moments where the tsunami and the explosion was projected on screen made me realize life has changed forever. While I was gathering information from TV broadcasts and the internet, I noticed the Japanese government claiming that there is no immediate eff effect on the human body. The information quickly became more unreliable. There may have been no immediate effect on the body, but they, that didn't exclude, ex exclude long-term consequences. I felt the government was behaving irresponsibly and was remained of the many times the Japanese government spread misinformation in the past. A uh, poignant example would be when Japan lost the war. Uh, when Japan lost the war, the Japanese government continued to give the false information on the radio that Japan has been attacking and winning and when the defeat was finally announced, the emperor admitted defeat via the radio. As the government broadcasts propaganda on TV, I found a nuclear expert explaining what was really happening. I was watching TEPCO's live broadcast for hours every day, and I could see the interviewer trying to disguise the truth. I noticed that the mass media was condensing TEPCO's press conferences, which lasted for hours every day, in one, mi one minute and two minutes of news. Putting together hours of information in one, min one minute means that no matter what TEPCO says, it can be para paraphrased in a convenient way. In fact, the media reporters who came to the con conferences were ignorant about nuclear power and familiar with politics and economics. I was stuck by the tremendous sense of emptiness when they wrote articles about what they didn't even understand to the public after being soaked overnight. Then I started working at IWJ because I thought I needed to check the primary information my by myself. While attending press conferences such as TEPCO, due to the pressure of the Japanese mass media, the government, the business community, and the electric power industry, I didn't pursue the Fukushima nuclear accident, but only reported by the statements, statements that TEPCO said. The big press can't criticize because the electric power industry generates a lot of revenue to for them. No one talked about nuclear accident even on variety shows. If the topic was broached, then the show and host would be removed. IWJ is a medium that does not receive any advertising money from the major companies and, and only getting a money on membership fees. So IWJ was able to criticize TEPCO openly being able to report in a transparent way, I felt relieved. 
the role of the media is to report what is happening in the world and our country. But just because they didn't report doesn't mean it can't be bad. Immediately after the nuclear power plant explosion, many anti-nuclear protests took place in various parts in Japan. However, the conservative media didn't report in on it at all. Not only were they not only were they afraid that the trend against nuclear power would be stronger, but they were also afraid that resistance from the general information population against nuclear power would become stronger. Japan has no neutral energy resources. Japan has no natural energy resources. If something would change on the world stage, the Japanese economy will suffer. This is because all energy supply depends on imports from overseas. After the war, nuclear, nuclear power generation has supported Japan's high growth period. It was very important for Japan to be independent energy-wise. After returning to the Netherlands in summer, I resumed studying at the Rietveld. At first, I was stuck by the diff difference in customs and I had a difficult difficulty adjusting to the new life. I was at a loss as how to express my new life in the Netherlands and what I exper experienced in Japan throughout. While talking to someone in the Netherlands, I realized that Fukushima nuclear accident was perceived quite differently from the actual situation in Fukushima. And I wanted to research through my work the phenomenon of Fukushima nuclear accident that people in different places have in common. After graduating from Richfield, I furthered my studies at Sandburn and finally, four years later, I wrote a dissertation about what I experienced, felt, and thought about Fukushima nuclear accident. After that, I made a work called Driving in Fukushima with a friend who was also from Fukushima while I was working at IWJ and presented it at the Fukushima Biennale. For the first time, I was able to combine my thoughts, the perspective of the journalist and art with this work. This work is an installation that summarizes interviews with women living in Fukushima questionnaires to people living in Japan and abroad, and videos of road trips. We also exhibit the daily necessaries received from women interviewed in Fukushima. Through this work, I would like to convey to many people the daily lives and scenery of Fukushima residents who live side by side with invisible radiation in places other than the inhabitant regions of Fukushima Prefecture. For me, this is a working in progress. After that, I tried to summarize my thoughts in an essay and translated it into a work of art. The content is wide, wide ranging, including works of globalization and local regions, and this of my grandfather and the book, uh, Rubbish as a Dead by Kenzabro Oe. For me, the process of creating, uh, creating a work while writing my thoughts is very important. For me, there is not much difference between thinking about journalism and social issues, especially human rights issues, and expressing that idea through art. I am interested in how art can express such problems. At this moment, we are confronted with situations where human rights are threatened. Refugees from Tibet, Uyghur concentration camps and women's rights in Afghanistan. Is the image that the media is portraying really correct? I think there are still many problems that remain uninvestigated and are overlooked or worse ignored. Issues, the general public is still not aware of. In the future, I would like to make people to be more aware of the humanitarian issues plaguing our world and our society.
That is why I will keep researching and analyzing those issues through the internet and expressing them using art. Thank you. worried that it won't give you feedback. No? You can. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Maria Mazzanti. I am an editor in Paleo Architecture. And right, I'm going to tell you a little bit how we covered the Colombian protests last year. Um, this needs a bit of context, so I'm going to try to be as fast as I can, but I hope I can make my 10 minutes. <laughs> Um, since 2019, we saw how, of course, there was like this race in the, like kind of a wave of new protests happening around the world with COVID-19. And of course, this is related a lot to inequality and of Colombia being one of the most unequal countries in the world wasn't an exception. I am Colombian, so that was also part of the interest of covering this. Um, the, everything that I'm going to tell you, it's kind of framed in Failed Architecture. Failed Architecture is a platform for critical urban discourse where we approach architecture not from the typical perspective of a design platform that is like the object, the aesthetics, and things like this, but it's actually spatial politics and what happens when this like, is like uh, urbanism and architecture are embedded like in a more social system, let's say. Um, so to start with that, I'm going to give you a couple of things that I think are quite important. The first one is thinking of the protest as a spatial event, more besides all the social event that it implies. It's also something that is kind of uh, rooted to the fact of the public and public space. And at the same time, it's uh, an assembly of bodies that together they become a space by in itself. They, we are not building something with brick and mortar, you're actually building something with bodies that are together and that have like agency to change the status quo. So that's part of the interest of covering this from the perspective of architecture. Um, the protests in Colombia started in 2019, originally. Um, there, were like a lot of, there was like a lot of police brutality and different events, and when 2020 started, of course, the pandemic put everyone home, and these strict lockdowns implied that people couldn't go out to the street, to the street again because Colombia was kind of uh, heavy in terms of lockdowns. So it was six months people couldn't go out. So being already unequal, being already a country with a long history of internal conflict, with already economic and like social grievances that were like growing and growing even more with the pandemic, in 2021 things exploded. Um, so uh, this is what I'm going to show you here. I think it works a little bit to understand the framing device of, uh, like, yeah, like the framing device of the narrative of the governments and traditional media in Colombia and how they portray protests. So this is a video of 2019. This guy is the city count was the city councilor. Nowadays is the Ministry of Defense, <laughs> and he was quite worried that public space in general in the entire country with the protest was being all damaged. Like they were attacking public space and like they were attack like protesters were attacking the police. So he came with this crazy idea of a protestodromo that is basically a stadium to host protests. So they won't disrupt public space. They won't disrupt quotidian everyday life, which is basically stripping the protest from its most important aspect that is not only the actual disruption, but actually making things visible and public. Uh, this was crazy. I mean, this place was supposed to have like a, a, a series of uh, props that you will remove and change after each protest. And this never happened, of course, but it was proposed by one of the, like someone with a kind of high rank in the government. So uh, I'm showing you this because I think it kind of gives you how protesters have been always framed in Colombia by like uh, in general media, and it's like you are just damaging the city, you are just like, I don't know, like loitering teenagers and riot people making riots, kind of invalidating a lot of claims that are, of course, justified in a very long history of inequality in the country. So uh, 
This one is nice. You can go and buy like uh, spray cans and stuff. Um, <laughs> anyway, this is a big contrast of what actually happened last year. This image shows, uh, well, this was one of the images. This is Bogota. But I'm going to give you numbers, so I'll make it fast. But n in the protest last year, uh, there were more than 5,000 cases of police brutality and abuses by the police. There were 37 sexual abuses also performed by the police, more than 50 people killed, and more than 100 people disappeared. So when you see those two realities and those numbers, then you have, of course, this an official narrative that is kind of erasing all the claims behind this, like the, of everything that has happened in Colombia with the conflict and everything. And on the other side, you also have the, the actual situation of, an op of a government that has been strictly, ex extremely oppressing people. Colombia has never had a, all the policies and like a governments in Colombia has always been like a right wing. So I think this also tells a little bit of the context. So um, as I was saying before, there is a particular claim towards public space and towards the space outside that it was why this became important for failed architecture to approach. During the protest, we saw a lot of like uh, appropriation of public space by protesters, uh, toppled monuments, um, mostly uh, protesters taking over uh, institutional spaces as well to transform them and turn them into other things. Uh, the street was also quite interesting in terms of tension. Everything that I just told you was made by performed by students, by indigenous communities, by basically people that has been oppressed for a very long time. But also on the other side, you will have, for example, these situations that I, I just wanted to show you because I think this shows like how this is a battle for literally the idea of what is public and what is not. Um, if you see there, like you see policemen protecting a monument of Columbus. So it's like, uh, I mean, it's absurd that they are attacking people but actually protecting these colonial figures. Uh, we would also see like uh, these people dressed in white covering graffiti made by the protesters with gray paint to protect public space. And the other one there is, for me, is the most paradigmatic in a way. It's uh, a group of people protecting a fake cardboard uh, image monument of a, conqui of a go Spanish conquistador, Sebastián de Belalcázar, um, which it was toppled the day before by a group, by, a, by an indigenous community called Misak. That they of course, I mean, this guy killed thousands of indigenous people in, in Colombia. And then they restated with this cardboard figure and sang around it like uh, holding hands. So the street was a place of tension. Like lots of things were happening and like this was kind of a, let's say, broad panorama of the entire story. So with failed architecture, we decided to approach this from, it was like seven months of different types of works. Uh, I'm gonna tell you quickly a little bit about them, but we did, a, well, we recorded a podcast with an NGO that was working on recording the numbers of police brutality in the city and asking for a police reform. Um, well, we also did kind of some kind of a, try to very modest gesture of participating during the protest with these posters that we're talking about the right to the city and the right to protest because it was something that was like kind of being violated constantly. <laughs> uh, one minute. Sorry. Um, then we, uh, this was an interview with an art historian about the importance of the legitimacy of these narratives that were also happening in the street and through different spaces in Bogota and through monuments and images in, so in social media. Uh, we became also a little bit more experiments in some of the events we did when we were reading these uh, scripts that we created for starting discussions. We visited some of the spa spaces that were quite important during the protest and of course wrote a few articles on this topic. Um, I think in general there was an intention of discussing the kind of the ideology of public space in this, sp in this specific like contexts as Colombia. Um, I was thinking of telling you a little bit about this article but I don't know if I have enough time. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thanks. Uh, okay, so this is a, an article that I, I co-authored with Juana Salcedo. She's an architect and a, um, and a historian. 
And six months after the protests were over, uh, there was like a big stir on social media because one of the most important places for the protest, that it was a monument in Bogota, was being, dis well, was being demolished, basically. Uh, this was the place. Uh, I'm going to go quite quickly about what happened with this place, but as, you, as I told you before, there was like a lot of police brutality happening all over the country. Of course, the traditional normal way of like walking through a street to a public square is actually one of the most dangerous situations if you're a protester because you don't have a place to escape. These things have been designed for social control. And this little island in the middle of important avenue became like, I, like urban acupuncture. Like they just kind of tackled this point. They were able to block avenues to block public transportation and take over an old nationalist monument that was the history of the heroes of independence. So I think it, it became quite a huge thing, but at the same time, what happened was that the, when they announced that it was gonna be demolished, this was announced many years ago. And when, it ha when they announced it first, people didn't care at all. It was like, yeah, I mean, it's fine. We don't really care about this monument, but it became the actual symbol of resistance during the, the protest. And for the other, let's say, part of the population or like more conservative sectors of the population, it was be them being defeated. Like they are gonna tear down our monument that it was all taken down by these protesters. So it became such a situation of discussions, especially on social media, that we use it kind of as a way to explore what was happening with public space and what this necessity of like kind of looking for more plur like a more plural space or public space in general by analyzing a little bit what was happening on social media. Uh, for example, this one says, with the drama they have been doing with the demolition of, uh, uh, with demolishing the monument to the heroes or Monumento a los Héroes, I am close to go to take some pieces to send them to sell them online. Uh, this was the symbol of the resistance during the protest in the spring of 2021. Uh, this is the military forces saying that they are going to go unprotected from the actual destruction of the of something that was made by the mayor, no? I mean, I mean, this was not destroyed by, it was destroyed by the mayor to make a new infrastructure stuff that it was supposed to happen in the city. So I think that this kind of shows not only the polarities, but also how important it was to bring this to like kind of a spatial perspective and why it was important to talk about the city in this specific case to bring other narratives that were also there, but that maybe through only a political traditional lens wouldn't be so obvious, I would say. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip that, but um, at the moment, the art that article is in Spanish. We translate it works, if you wanna read it, but we are translating it. And there is also more info on palearchitecture.com, especially on the one of the podcasts that is called La Ciudad Nuestra, La Noche es Nuestra, that it has a long introduction in English that explains quite well this without running with the 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Is this good? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm really excited to do this today. I was also asked to do this, so I'm very honored. And for people watching online, hey, <laughs> I'm Justine. Um, I'm an artist and I'm a model. I uh, recently graduated from the Ferrer Roosevelt Academic Department Fine Arts, and I was in a residency recently that ended with an exhibition at Amsterdam called Artwell, maybe you heard of it. Um, so a little bit about me to kind of loosen up. <laughs> um, I always had a thing for the macabre. I love horror films, thriller films, murder documentaries, you name it, I love it. Um, especially also psychedelic images and uh, soft erotic photography, highly obsessed with that as well. Um, I'm also very fascinated by things I find on the streets, um, trash, objects, sort of that type of thing, but especially when they come into files, because that kind of makes me feel like a detective. I'm kind of sorting it out, you know, like, oh, has this been placed here on purpose? Did the wind do this? Did a little kick, kick kicked against it? You know, stuff like that. And I make photos of it, or sometimes 
I take it home with me and use it for an installation. Uh, let's see, where am I? Oh yeah. This <laughs> da -da -da -da, is a um, performance I did called Half and Half. And, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I uh, work here as an alter ego called Annemiek. Uh, she's actually completely the opposite of me. She's a businesswoman, very good with numbers, which I'm totally not. Um, here are some other images. I can speak a little bit about it because it might be <laughs> very vague on screen. Uh, let me see. Okay, so here with my partner, I uh, made the perfect minced meatball out of eight kilos of minced meat. And my partner was um, dropping all the ingredients needed for a perfect meatball, a bowl. He was even, in this specific photo, he was even brushing his teeth and rinsing it with milk. And when the timer went off, five minutes went by because that's when you cook the perfect egg, apparently. Uh, it was time for him to drop his pants and lay an egg in my pan. Uh, later, we added this egg to the perfect meatball, stack a candle in it, lit it, because it was someone's birthday. <laughs> Maybe you know him, it's called Willem de Ridder. Okay. Um, oh yeah, I'm also a painter, and um, I'm very fascinated by the darker side of things on life. But also, I make small observations in the everyday. And for instance, a little insight about me, I have an obsession with my glass apples. I used to collect them since I was a child because it's biting in glass, you know. So here we have an apple. <laughs> and um, ask my friends, it takes me ages to bite into this apple because I always have this mental image in my head that if I would take a bite and I would look at the apple again, these two front teeth would be stuck in it. I don't know why, but <laughs> I still have this thing. So when I'm with friends, I always play with this apple and they're constantly like, take a bite, Justine, take a bite. But I, I cannot do it. But thinking about this, I think the apple is also a really dark thing because if we think about the apple, the history of it, the Adam and Eve story, very heavy, yeah? <laughs> and uh, it started to make me think because it feels like Evil is deeply ingrained in us, like if we go out from the Bible. So this started to make me think, this whole story. And um, then I started to write my thesis. I can pass it around if you like. Um, so when I started to write my thesis, I noticed uh, small similarities, um, small similarities between the artist and the serial killer, as well as the ways of seeing as a spectator or a detective. And I became highly obsessed with this. So for instance, let's talk about this. This is uh, Ed Gein, one of the most notorious serial killers ever out there. And in my opinion, this man was highly obsessed with aesthetic, but highly obsessed. For instance, one of my favorites, the nipple belt made out of female nipples. Uh, of course, don't forget the human soup bowl. And this one is very clever, gloves made out of hands. But also, when he dug up his mother's grave, he started to decorate her with silver embellishments. I mean, how more aesthetic can you go? But as artists, we also have a love for the aesthetic. We're always trying to seek beauty in the unbeauty and trying to translate this. As a spectator, we are trying to find words for what we see, just like a detective. So for instance, if we have this apple again, yeah, um, a spectator would say, oh, this is round, you can eat it, you can make juice out of it. Um, it's the color yellow, orangey, primarily red. But as an artist, we could say, um, I could throw this into a window. Um, I could put it on my head. I can make a sculpture with it, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> oh, yeah. Art can give you a bodily feeling, putting your mind in a specific place. Or it can completely fade away, like you're no longer there. 
floating through space. You and art are then one. Just like when you would look at a crime scene, you then must come into a specific headspace. Artists touch upon the same feeling. We all know the feeling that we are thinking about doing something dangerous. Yeah, so, okay, let me paint this example for you. I sometimes have this mental image in my head that if I have this really sharp knife when I'm cooking, I can just stick it in my leg, but I will never do this, right? But it's so weird because I can feel it I can taste it, I can smell it, I'm already there because the mental image is there, but what is holding me back? The consequences, so we're not doing it, right? Um, da, 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 da. Oh yeah. But this is our design, this is our creation. We turn these feelings into work, this mental and bodily feeling, just like a killer. Only the killer doesn't inflict it on a material like clay and objects or canvas, etc., but uses the other human as the other objects for his creation, his design, or his masterpiece. In my opinion, um, in my opinion, art has no rules, no good, no bad, just everything in between. It's almost like a childlike fantasy sometimes jaded in an adult world. Sex and violence lay very close in my opinion. But in my humble opinion, and I'm gonna show you a small example, um, there was this artist called John Duncan, and in my opinion, he crossed the line just a little bit. So this is the piece by John Duncan. Uh, he made a performance where he has sex with the corpse of a woman. Um, also, <laughs> that piece of text is quite interesting. If you feel like reading it, please do. Um, yeah, and the problem for me uh, lays within this woman could never have given, you know, consent to this. So, yeah. <coughs> when we speak of a serial killer, most times their childhood was very unpleasant. It has been taken from them. The abused became the abuser. Their teddy bear has been taken from them. And Mike Kelly wrote a quite, in quite interesting thing about this. He compares a child's teddy bear to adult toys. It's the obsession with it, the touch, the, s the feel, and the smell of it. So when I used to be very little, um, I had this huge collection of stuffed animals, and there's always you know, one favorite that you take everywhere around with you. But oh man, when my mother wanted to put it in a wash after I had had lice, I would lose my shit. Because it didn't have that intimate feeling anymore. I didn't felt close to it anymore. It was almost this perverted obsession with it. And it reminds me instantly of my own bedroom when I think about this. Um, I keep stuffed animals there and plastic toys I used to play with as a kid. But they don't serve the same purpose anymore. They serve the purpose because I like the way they look. They serve the purpose as being a decoration. So the purpose they once served is completely gone. But, you know, it makes me feel and think about my own mortality and something I can hold on to. It makes me aware of the fact I once was an infant, pure. Sometimes I feel very guilty about this when I see them in my room next to an ashtray and birth control and a pack of condoms. A room that is for an adult now and not for a child. I'm not a child anymore, but they are immortally stuck in their frozen age. I am not. I am not immortal. When we speak about crime and art, there's always something about the misfortune of others itself. We are trying to make it into an aesthetic, but then keeping that rawness, the essence. We are hiding by revealing. Think about it. Art is not that interesting when we can figure it out immediately, because at the end, we are all creatures that need a challenge. And artists and serial killers are giving the audience what they want, because we know for damn sure that if the spectator and the detective figure it out quickly, it will be a strike against their ego.
Some people study the world, other people live the world, and a few are the world. People want to control everything. Artists and criminals take over something or someone, but lose control over rules and laws. We are above the law. Living in a different world, just like I said earlier, like a childhood fantasy. Just me, myself, and I. It's about an action that is not automatic, but somewhere completely in between. In the end, we all need an audience, but not as a cheap trick. We need authenticity. We all need an audience because otherwise we don't exist. Like my grandma used to tell me, does a tree fell in the woods if no one is there to hear it? We will stop when we get caught, but we will always carry on. We are not looking for a full understanding. We want you to see and to listen. So this was a little bit about the research I did um, with my thesis, and now I'll speak a uh, very short time about my work. Okay. So um, my paintings are, uh, of course, highly influenced by um, crime, <laughs> but also about hedonism. Um, this I showed earlier is uh, my best friend. She's also sitting in the audience. She's my main inspiration. Um, so yeah, apply um, mostly applying and then um, erasing the paint constantly. It's all about hiding and revealing over and over again, just what would happen during a crime scene. It's finding the evidence and trying to make sense out of it. Sometimes the things you don't see are the most important ones. Making it blurry, forever there but in a haze, just like the dead, like a shrine that simply fades away by time. My work mostly works on distance, uh, just like when we would look at a crime scene, an overview, in order to see, depixelate. In order to do horrific things, you must separate the person from the person, if that makes sense, but depersonalize. You must see the person as an object or even a tool for your own pleasure by making their faces in a blur by this making them eternal and forever yours. My paintings are the faces, the objects are the evidence, and the installation is the story. Or if I speak through the eyes of a detective, the recreation of a story, but I'm not, I'm not a detective. This is my creation, this is my design. I am the killer. Thank you. The final speaker is Brie Logan. She was one of the reporters mentioned at the beginning who uh, covered the Hisley Maxwell case. She's based in Brooklyn, so she'll um, come in digitally and she's been listening to everybody's um, presentations. So um, uh, we'll make some comments and, and draw it together. And she's a good one also for any questions that you might have afterwards. Does anyone have any questions? I guess if she arrives, then it's maybe, because it's quite an open question. Like I'm generally more interested because there's been so much diverse way to talk about 
art making and journalism, neo journalism, which I think also has arose not only in our spheres, but for example, when I see some social commentary on YouTube or just the genre, I guess, of like fi non creative fiction writing. And I'm just wondering because neo journalism, specifically for you, I guess, because you mentioned how neo journalism should have, or artistic journalism should have specific requirements. I'm wondering if we could discuss a bit more of those because I think it's a big aspect of the criticisms towards it that it's sort of like a hybrid thing that wants to talk about embodied knowledge that some individuals are you know very well um, positioned to talk about but that it also somehow as you say is so deeply personal that it doesn't reveal so much truth when I would argue the contrary personally but I, I'm just wondering how can this genre really somehow be supported and better established when it faces a criticism that is, you know, pushing away this sort of like transdisciplinarity. So I'm just wondering if we could talk more about the requirements of it because I think it's actually at, at the core of it somehow and of how to, to do that if there's such a way to do it. I don't know, sorry if it was a very long question. Thanks, let me see if I understand it correctly. So you're talking about the requirements that um, the journalism ideology uh, has in mind, so to say? Okay, okay, good point. So first of all, new journalism is a kind of a, a literary movement, an, a narrative journalism that uh, you see uh, in many parts of the world. In, in Poland, you have a huge movement. In Aust Australia, apparently, in, in the US, the new uh, journalism uh, started. Uh, now, um, there are many more art forms, and they also cross the line with journalism, or claim, or label themselves as journalism. Uh, there's one author who has been writing a lot about this, uh, Alfredo Camarotti is his name. Uh, he wrote Aesthetic Journalism. And this is, this is kind of, uh, historically you could say this is uh, an arts movement. So it's come from the arts direction. And it's developed uh, within the arts as a need to uh, kind of become more socially engaged. And then you have the other direction that's coming from journalism which uh, needs to explore different ways to reach new audiences. And also, um, there is this emotional turn in journalism in which journalists uh, actually see that this objective stance that they always um, felt that they had to, um, to heed to, to, to be impartial and neutral, is not working. Y you need to feel you need to be there, you need to participate sometimes as a journalist. So that's where lines start to blur. And for journalism, that means uh, sometimes a revision of these old uh, ideas on objectivity, for example, or impartiality. Um, and um, I think in this, uh, artists can bring a lot to, to journalism. And also, well, uh, I, can, I can say a lot of things about it. I don't know if, if this is kind of what you mean. <laughs> That's good. All right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh, can you hear me now? Great. It's okay like this. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Brianna. Um, I am a digital content creator. I have been working on other accounts as a social media producer for years, including um, a documentary crime show. So I've been um, exposed to the different ways that we can create content around um, journalism through the lens of 
of other people. But when it came to the Ghislaine trial, I wanted to take it on as an independent creator. Um, I did that. I, I went every day to the trial um, and I created my Instagram page. I did three posts a day. I did one post of the outside New York City. I did a second post of me taking um, the lunch break and going live and talking about what I had seen so far in that day. And then I did a third post of a podcast every evening. Um, what I thought was really interesting was um, there was a lot of resistance to the more social media journalists, the third party journalists um, from the more seasoned journalists that were there with big networks. And um, it was definitely an energy that was intimidating, but you, you could feel the surgence of, of new journalists coming in and you could feel that um, there was a tide changing with the way we communicate the news. It was really inspiring to see people with sub stacks and podcasts and Instagrams do really well with their message and um, it's inspired, I think, a lot of third party journalists who are at the Glane trial to continue to find other pieces of media that really need extra amplification. Because the great part about being a third party journalist is that you don't have an editor with ulterior motives telling you to lean one way or another. It can really come from your heart and soul. So as an artist, who happens to also really be interested in crime and journalism, I have really appreciated what Instagram has given me the opportunity to really um, branch out and, and make, make it aesthetically really fun and make it um, digestible and be able to do short clips of news and put my whole personality in it. So I'm really happy with the way things turned out and I'm really looking forward to seeing um, what I'm going to be able to create next. Are there any questions? Can you guys hear me? Hi, Zoom, thank you. Um, so does anybody have any questions uh, for or any of the speakers, but also Brie, why she's still online? Pass it on the cup, please. Good. Very nice. Okay. Um, so there was actually a question that I had for you <laughs> um, about the um, uh, Getty bot. I think that's, I found that fascinating. I hadn't heard about that before. Is, w is it already being used and if so will it will it be will it be um communicated that it was that that image was sourced via that rather than by the traditional sort of image editing procedure uh yeah it's it's still in development as they as they call it it's still in development uh and i think they want to offer it like as a service, and I think mostly for maybe smaller uh, news outlets or other uh, practitioners that need images in a sense that they don't need to hire a team for this. So it's really to about saving money. I mean, they bring it like this, like, oh, this great uh, service. But at the same time, it's really double because Getty can exist and it exists for photo editors and for journalists and for creators uh, as a way to purchase images. Uh, so they need these people, but they're also using these people to kind of make a different set of uh, income from it. So there are news outlets that are actually boycotting Getty Images for this because it's kind of using your, yeah, your audience in a sense. Um, so I think they got a lot of uh, pushback from it. So th Maybe that's why it's taking so long. Uh, and the algorithm needs to be fed, of course, and taught. And I think that takes a long time before they can actually offer a service that makes sense. Uh, but image banks are already using for a long time like image sets. So there's main events and they say like, oh, war on Ukraine, use this set. And that's like a stack of maybe 15 images. That's also why you see a lot of the same images appearing uh, on different media outlets. 
two more questions for Bree. One, can you talk a little bit? <laughs> can you talk a little bit about the um, the snobbery that you um, experienced firsthand uh, in the lineup, the, the media yep. lineup to cover the courts, and how the sort of the hierarchy works? I know that I talked about the um, in my introduction. I'm not sure if you heard it about Vicky Ward, who is that quite uh, um, had has some reputation from Vanity Fair, and I know that when we first spoke, you talked about how she behaved in the courtroom, but also this sort of the snobbery that exists between um, sort of contracted full-time journalists for big media empires, you know, whittling, I don't want to say down, but across to the other extreme, which might be um, uh, Instagram, um, Instagram uh, celebrities. But also, the, the second question, which is also tied into that, maybe you can talk a little bit about how Substack has really taken off and what yep. if what, I mean, I, I imagine that in this case it also played somewhat of a role. And if you can sort of talk about from from the from your perspective there in New York, how that's working. Yeah. So what I experienced in the hierarchy, I had one afternoon where a male journalist from a really big, um, a really big media company made a sexual joke to me, and I podcasted about it that evening, and I was talking about the irony of this man making a joke about um, oral sex to me um, it, at a Jeffrey Epstein trial, at a Ghislaine Maxwell trial. It was just, it was just a lot. And um, the next day he yelled at me in the hallway in front of all the other reporters. And I said to him, you know, microaggressions like this are why we are where we are, to, literally where we are today in this courtroom. And he yelled at me, he said, you're not a journalist. Why are you even here? And uh, a few days later, an ABC reporter um, pointed me out to other people and said, why is this girl here? Why can't she just let us do our jobs? And I was like, you guys have had a decade to report on this man and, and this woman and these crimes. And you've chosen not to because your big bosses get paid a lot of money to not mention things. And um it was just one of those things like, you know, I had to push through and you sit in a room and you know, everyone thinks that you're two inches tall, but you have to believe that you're bigger than that. And you have to believe that like you're fighting for a future of other journalists who are third party to just go in and do what they believe is, is true and true reporting and in true perspective. So um, it was really intimidating. It was definitely like my toughest point of the trial was when I felt like um, I had been marginalized because I shared an experience where I felt like I was verbally, sexually harassed um, by someone that makes a lot of money in journalism and is a reporter. And the irony was not lost on me, um, but I'm really glad I stuck it out. Um, as far as as the female journalists like Julie K. Brown and and, and Vicky Ward. They definitely, like you could tell, like they were so invested in what was going on. And um, I think every single female that was there had had like another reason that they were there. And I think it's really a, a thin line to not become bigger than the story. And I think that any journalist in any kind of conversation needs to remember the story is not about them, um, but especially when I think a lot of people saw like a surge of new followers, um, whether it's their Substack or their Instagram or their podcast, everyone, like some people had fans, like the, some people who had like really big accounts had fans coming to the courtroom and going through security just so their fans could talk to them inside the courtroom. And um, it's really tempting to, to make it your moment, but you can't because that's when you make mistakes and that's when you get sloppy and that's when when things like are take a left turn and then the victims ultimately pay the biggest price um but i think substack is important and instagram and podcasts are important because there's no big editor to tell you which way to go and it can be really frustrating when you only have like a dozen substack uh, followers or you want i i, only, I have about 25 hundred Instagram followers, but there's people with like tens of thousands of Instagram followers that I was, you know, shoulder to shoulder with every day. But you just have to think about the long term of what 
kind of path you're making for the journalists yet to come? Okay, thanks, Bree. Um, have you're anybody welcome. else got any questions that they'd like to ask? If not, then thank you everybody for coming. It was uh, really uh, interesting and confronting and oftentimes quite personal event. Um, thank you again to Ava and Mark. And uh, if anybody wants to talk to anybody personally or individually, there's a wine at the top of the stairs. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody, uh, like Maria said. I want to just add one note. Um, we will put my computer up at the top um, because we will, we're kind of still very much in development and starting to organize more events related to both uh, research, journalism and art and design, but also research in general in the Sonberg. So if you would like to stay up to date on really research specific type of events, then you can leave your email address and then we will keep you updated. So, and now we will have a drink. Thank you. <laughs>